everyone. I'm Annette Giesecke, the symposium organizer, and I would like to introduce the symposium's first keynote speaker, Eric Tonsmeyer. Eric has studied and practiced permaculture since 1990. He is the author of Perennial Vegetables and co-author of Edible Forest Gardens with Dave Jack, and recently published Paradise Lost, Two Plant Geeks, One-Tenth of an Acre, and the Making of an Edible Oasis in the City, with contributions from Jonathan Bates. Eric has worked in small farm business training, uh, ran a seed company and an urban farm project, and is now a full-time writer, trainer, and consultant. His current interest is in large-scale permaculture farming as a carbon sequestering solution to climate change. Eric is also building bridges between the permaculture and native plant movements by emphasizing useful native plants. Um, notably, Eric is brought to us today by Millersville Native Plants, so we are grateful to them and grateful to Eric for coming. And uh, without further ado, here he is. Well, good morning, and thanks for having me. Um, we'll be talking about um, what I like to think of as the ultimate ecological garden today, which not only provides benefits to the environment and habitat, but also provides food for us and helps to handle and process our wastes and turn them into renewable resources once again. Um, and I'll be... Strongly emphasizing the native plants of the area. I certainly don't exclusively grow native plants at all in my food garden. I don't know anyone who does. But um, I feel like I've yet to find anyone who is doing it as thoroughly as we could. And so my effort has been to kind of try and raise that bar. And this is just at, uh, this is at the Denver Botanic Garden where there's a beautiful edible landscape demonstration garden showing what you can do just with lettuce, which turns out to be a really lovely ornamental if you take care of it properly. And I've had lovely experience with uh, those uh, rainbow chards, which make a fantastic, fantastic bedding plant. And the red boar kale, it's like a pur purplish palm looking kale. Absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. So. Um, this will not be a thorough inventory of all possible species that you can cover by any stretch of the imagination. That's really, actually, that's a full weekend workshop we're going to do at Dale's Place this fall. But, um, so why, why is edible landscaping important? Well, it gets people to interact with the landscape in a different way. You have to go out and not just enjoy the beauty, but harvest some, and you're not just weeding what you're getting to, to really uh, sustain yourself from it in a different way. There are a number of really phenomenal food plants that you just can't buy at the store, um, and you can't beat the freshness of a strawberry right out of your garden, or some asparagus that was just cut and brought inside, or, or sweet corn, or whatever it might be. And um, certainly for people who are interested in local food, there's no more local than right outside the back door. And, and there's a, there is a, a rationale behind the ecological nature of food production that I think uh, has been missing in some conversations that when we, the, way, the line I use about this is that the native plant garden is not sufficiently ecological. And the food plant garden without habitat planting is, is not sufficiently ecological. And the reason I would say a native plant garden is not ecological enough is if all your food is coming from the supermarket and being shipped in from Mexico and Brazil, there's a tremendous carbon footprint to your food. And if your wastes, in my town anyway, all our, our sewer systems are combined sewer overflows, I bet you have some of those around here in the cities anyway. Every time there's a big storm, the sewage combines with the rainwater and goes right out into the river. That's not terribly ecological either. Our food waste, instead of being composted, goes to landfills. That's not sufficiently ecological either. So we need to raise the bar, I think, of what it means to be a responsible human being uh, in our gardens. And it, not thinking just about the agrochemicals that are used and the fossil fuel used to bring things to us, but the tremendous amount of fossil water. Most of our vegetables in season come from California. And they're all almost all irrigated with fossil groundwater, with aquifers that are non 
renewable at the scale at which we're using them, causing immense problems in California ecosystems. So I think we need to take all that into account when we're thinking about the, the footprint of our gardens and the positive. So many times in the environmental world, I think we think about all the negative things we do and how bad people are and all the horrible things we do. But I think we also need to give ourselves credit for the positive things we can do and see if we can get a positive balance on our, on our impact. And they, some people describe that not as your footprint, but as your handprint. And you want your handprint to be bigger than your footprint, so I like that. Um, so, so yes, I do think that it's possible to have gardens that, that provide both the ecological benefits of a native plant garden and provide food for people. And the best way to do that is with edible native plants, blueberries being kind of the best example. They are the native plant um, which of the eastern United States, which has attained the greatest level of popularity, the greatest level of domestication, um, depending on what you, whether you think the sunflower is really native in the eastern United States or not, which I think is a matter of some controversy. But certainly blueberries, I think to me, are the ultimate emblem of this kind of garden in that they're beautiful in four seasons. They're absolutely delicious. They're one of Talamy's top woody plants for providing the caterpillar um, anchor to the food chain. And um, they can be grown with very poor fertility. In fact, they require acid soils, um, which many of us are blessed or cursed with, depending on how you want to think about it. So, so I've chosen the blueberry as my sort of gold standard to try and bring other things up to. And the world to which I, the world I come to this um, conversation from is the world of permaculture, where we're, or the edible forest garden, that's what the EFG means up there in the blue, where we're really looking at the world's palette of useful plants that can provide food, that are low maintenance and perennial, that can provide fertility and do these other functions we'll talk about. But I'm very interested in the native species palette. I've done native plant, you know, I worked for a native wetland plant place for years and went out and did seed collecting and did restoration work and stuff. And I love that as well. But some of those aren't particularly useful to humans directly. But there's this palette in the middle of useful native plants that I don't think anyone is paying enough attention to. Or I'm just ignorant, which is very, very absolutely undeniable. But I look around, you know, I read stuff, and I'm not seeing a lot of real strong emphasis on that. So that's where I've been trying to focus my attention and point people on both sides, who really, these two groups sometimes hate each other and fight a lot over things like hardy kiwi and whatnot. But I think we need to look at the shared ground as our primary emphasis. Um, so my, one of my fun challenges is to try and eat an all-native meal from the supermarket. And these right here are the only species that I'm aware of which are Eastern native foods that you can buy at the store. Does anybody have other ones that you can think of? I'd love to add some more to the list. They're pretty hard to find. Do you find them in the supermarket? Oh, this, this would be things you could buy at the supermarket, something you could buy at the, at the what is it, A&P down here? Sometimes you can find pawpaws. Great. American persimmons? You can find Asian persimmons. Yeah, there may be one or two more, but it's not like there's a huge diversity at the supermarket is sort of the idea here, right? And, and this doesn't really represent a complete diet. There's no salad in there. Sometimes you can find fiddleheads. Non-native. There, there is a native dandelion, but you won't find that one. I found um, occasionally we get fiddleheads in this store, and sometimes you get native mushrooms, wild harvested mushrooms. Which one? Yes, but the seedless one, the thornless ones are not Eastern natives. Yes. But you're thinking, you're asking all the right questions. You're thinking all the right things. Occasionally see hickory nuts. Great. Excellent. Not native. Very common. Very delicious. Not native. There are native watercresses in a different genus. My experience has been that they don't taste nearly as good, unfortunately. But I'm working on it. I'm trialing them. You know, I'm trying to get them out there. So anyway, so this is just an interesting thing to think. 
just how far we are from even having it be possible for people to eat native foods from the supermarket, which really means you're growing them yourself. Um, and um, in terms of the type of foods, a lot of people, when they think edible landscaping, they think fruit, which I have no problem with that. I grow 43 species of fruit on my tenth of an acre at home. I'm a big fruit fan. But um, we're talking about, you know, vegetables as well as fruits, mushrooms. Um, I grow fish and chickens and so on at my house. Rabbits, these are all possibilities for the edible landscape, honey, certainly. And some of the, we're not just looking though, when we're, when, when we're designing an ecological garden, we're not just looking at what we can eat and what provides habitat, but we're also looking at other functions that happen in nature, one of which is nitrogen fixation. The natural creation of fertilizer by plants. And the way this works is there are, um, these uh, symbiotic bacteria or actinomycetes, or sometimes blue-green algae, uh, that live in the roots of plants, that live in these nodules on the plants. And the bacteria can take atmospheric nitrogen, which plants cannot utilize, and convert it into a form that the plants can use. And the plants can perform photosynthesis and create carbohydrates, which the bacteria cannot do. So they trade back and forth. There's an exchange. It's a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, and with uh, annual cover crops in your garden or on a farm, those need to be tilled into the soil to make that nitrogen available to the following crop. But with perennial nitrogen fixers, it becomes available over time through leaf litter, through root hair dieback, and actually through mycorrhizal fungi spreading the nitrogen around, apparently up to about 30 or 35 feet, 10 meters. Um, and what I've done is, um, there's an article on my website where I assess the relative nitrogen fixing capacity of native and non-native nitrogen fixing plants of the mid of the eastern United States uh, and compare different trees, shrubs, herbs, and vines and native and non-native. And it's interesting that certain things start to pop up out of that of the many, many, not all legumes fix nitrogen and not all Nitrogen fixers are legumes. New Jersey tea, for example, fixes nitrogen. Bayberry fixes nitrogen. Um, but two of the ones that are of relatively high for native species are the false indigo, Morpha fruticosa, which I absolutely love. And there's a dwarf one, which is to die for, a Morpha nana. So beautiful when it's in flower, it's to die for. And then Senna marilandica. Senna is interesting because the cassias, or the cassias and sennas, are one of the few genera some of which do and some of which don't fix nitrogen. Cinna marilanica, however, is a good one and is really absolutely a beautiful, stunning plant when it's in flower. And I think the pod's very nice ornamental too. So nitrogen fixing plants, one of the functions. We're also looking at pest control. And um, personally, I don't care for spraying. I haven't sprayed anything, even organic in my garden. This is now the seventh year coming along. I won't spray. Things that need to be sprayed, I don't grow. I can walk to the farmer's market. I'm not a farmer. I'm not making money on it. I'm not self-sufficient. I don't starve if it doesn't grow. I can afford to experiment. I have the privilege to be able to experiment. So one of the ways in which I do that is, do you all have tomato hornworms down here, right? Great big caterpillar eats, devastates tomato plants. They're huge. They're very beautiful, stunning. Um, but if you see those white things on the back, those are the cocoons of the braconid wasp. And the way this works is this is a braconid wasp, and there are at least a thousand species of parasitoid and parasitic wasps and mini wasps and, and hoverflies and ladybugs and all these things. There's an immense diversity of these organisms. Braconid wasp is a long ovipositor which is what it lays its eggs with. It lays its eggs in a happy caterpillar, which is enjoying its life, eating your tomatoes, devastating your tomatoes. And then the eggs hatch out. And they crawl around inside and they eat the caterpillar, starting with the least essential organs so they can prolong their meal as long as possible. Nature is you know, a place of harmony and caring and wonderfulness. 
Uh, and then they crawl out of the back. And my wife is an amateur entomologist. She made me watch under a hand lens, watch them crawl out. It was, they chew their way out. It was, I, I almost passed out. And they make a cocoon around themselves. And then in, I think it was about four or five days, the little, there's a little trap door hatch on the top that opens up and the adults come out. And, but the adults don't eat insects. They're pollinators. And unlike, let's say, a bee or a butterfly or a hummingbird, they don't have a long tongue. They need easy access flowers. And the two families, which are best for that, there's many, many more, and I don't, their scientists don't understand it all yet. They haven't researched it all yet. But the two best families are the umble family, your APAC, in this case, the native cow parsnip, which is a phenomenally beautiful plant that causes horrible boils if you get the sap on you in the sun, um, which I still grow because I just love it. And then, um, uh, in this case, green and gold. The, the daisy subtribe of the aster family is also noted to be one of these best beneficial insect families. So if you have something in those families flowering all through the season, not only do you have beauty in flowering calendar, but you have pest control. This doesn't control all kinds of pests. We've had very good luck with aphids, with caterpillars, but we have plenty of beetles, we have plenty of slugs. It's not a solution for everything. But every insect that you don't have to deal with is still a good thing. And then you have beauty, you have more native plants, and many of these are edible as well, so you're getting multiple functions out of them. Oh, it totally kills the worm. Yeah, then at, at this point, it can't move anymore. Okay. And, and so if they don't, if you don't see that on your worm is it, is it, are you condoning, you know, switching them? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. I yeah. Like oh, yeah. Oh, every time. Every time, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Yeah, although, honestly, I've never had one without this. By the time they're big enough for me to see them, they already have this on them, just at my house, but... Braconid, but there's, you know, I don't know, a hundred species of bracket and wasp. Each one has a different, you know, a lot of them have kind of very particular host organisms and stuff. Some of them are more generalist. And I'm not an entomologist. I don't, I just like, I think bugs are cool, but I'm not a um, specialist. Then there's also these habitat elements that we can provide. In addition to nectar, there's other things we can do. Um, did you, well, there's the thalamus plants, right, these, these uh, anchors, and I really appreciate that contribution he made. I'm sure he and I would, would argue about a lot of the things I grow, but I really appreciate the contribution that he's made to gardening in identifying this really important ecosystem function of plants that are especially, that not all plants are equal when it comes to serving as an anchor for the food chain. Some are particularly popular with caterpillars which are popular with birds, which then go and eat all the other bugs. So those are important anchors. Certainly planting some extra berries for the birds and so on is great, like mulberries or, or june berries, especially those tree june berries that are too high, high to pick. By the way, there's a beautiful june berry right outside the front door loaded with ripe fruit right now. Um, Dead stalks, that is a very sophisticated, on the top right there, very sophisticated, high-tech, beneficial insect device breeder right there, which is dead stalks put inside a tin can. The favorite place for many of these beneficial organisms to overwinter is inside hollow stalks. So if you hold off on deadheading until spring, or if you hold off on some of that cleanup till spring, you're providing habitat for these organisms. Um, obviously, the more you spray, the more they die. And a lot of the organic sprays are actually worse than non-organic ones because they're more broad spectrum. Like pyrethrum will kill everything. It's made from a flower, but it kills everything. Um, which is one of the reasons I like to not spray anything at all when, when I can. Um, that, that's an edible water garden down there. And a water element is really key to providing water for birds for dragonflies and a lot of these other excellent beneficial organisms require water. They're animals, they need water. Um, and then uh, there used to be a science called economic ornithology. I should say there is a science called economic ornithology that doesn't get a lot of credit anymore. 
And this is the three volume set I have these at home, Birds of, New Birds of Massachusetts and Other New England States by Edward Howe Forbush, who was the state economic ornithologist of Massachusetts, which used to be, that was a thing. There was an economic ornithologist for the state whose job was to study birds and their economic impact on agriculture. And what he found is that in almost every case, it's positive. He went out and shot hundreds of birds and cut open their stomachs at different times of year. That's how science was done at the time. And counted how many bugs of what kind and what percentage insect versus plant and so on. And he went on farms and in orchards and so on to see what they did. And almost all the songbirds are positive, even the ones that eat some of your berries like catbirds which is frustrating sometimes, catbirds, um, are also eating insects. Hummingbirds eat very large amounts of insects. Um, and so on. So anyway, you can go through that. And actually, I have a bunch of this in the back of the Edible Forest Gardens book. We did a, a brief list of maybe 40 or 50 kinds of birds. And this bird-by-bird -bird gardening is a really lovely example um, of how to target a garden to particular bird families. And generally, the benefits go family by family. All the warblers are pretty similar, for example. All the flycatchers are pretty similar. Flycatchers, not surprisingly, very good for insect control. Wrens, amazing for insect control. Um, so bird by bird gardening tells you how to lay out a garden, both structurally, like what kind of cover and what kind of plants, and what kinds of food and water elements they like to have. It does encourage you to grow non-native plants just for bird food. And personally, I don't think that's a good idea. I think there's plenty of perfectly fine native plants to plant. If you're planting it just for birds, plant something native. That's just me. Um, that's not just me, I guess. But that's, that's my perspective. That's my personal position on the, on the issue. And I'll just point out the alder up here. My example of a talmy plant also fixes nitrogen. So you're looking at a multi-purpose species, and really, when you're especially looking for small areas, but more broadly, we want to design for multifunctionality. We want to choose species that have multiple benefits so we can plug them into each other and create an ecosystem that works as well as possible. Um, generally, we're looking at aiming for systems that are low maintenance once they are established. No garden is easy to establish that I've ever, <laughs> that I've ever put in. But, um, once established, we want low maintenance. This one's in California, and it's um, next to a parking lot at an at a um, <coughs> excuse me at an HIV garden there, an HIV food bank, and we have passion fruit and tree collards, which is a thing that we can't grow. It's collards that grow 12 feet high and are essentially immortal because they never flower. Um, there's loquats. There's pineapple guavas. That's a nice edible landscape. And they don't do anything except a little bit of weeding like you can never get away from anywhere. That's what I like is a low maintenance system. And I do have some things like sea kale, which is a perennial broccoli. It's lovely ornamental. The plants are now 13 years old. They come back every year, they make broccoli. They took about three years to get established. But 13 year old broccoli plants, pretty cool. Pretty interesting. Dale likes them. They smell phenomenal, right? Yeah. Uh, OK, so utilizing native species. And, and this is really, um, to plant them, but also to use them. In this case, this is a multifunctional native species. This is the hog peanut, or ground bean, Amphicarpa bracteata that um, more and more people are growing in gardens. Dale actually has some in his nursery. I was looking at some beautiful ones this morning. Uh, it's native. It likes dry shade. Nothing likes dry shade, right? Dry shade. It fixes nitrogen. It has edible beans above and below ground. And it can be a very aggressive ground cover that smothers everything less than three feet high, except for spring ephemerals. At home, I have ramps and toothwort that come up that are edible, spring ephemerals. And then they die back. And then this one comes out. And that's all under pawpaws on the north side of the house. So I've got four native edible species growing together and utilizing a full shade alley. I feel good about that. I feel like that's working. So hog peanut is an example of something that almost nobody grows, but it's pretty enough in its own way. And, um, and it's quite nice eating. Those beans are very good. They're hard to find because they're underground and they have a brown skin on them. So they look like dirt. 
that they taste great. Uh, harvesting rainwater. Um, it's funny that many of us pay for water and then dump our water away that falls on our homes and our driveways and contribute to stormwater problems. So can we capture and store that rainwater in tanks? And can we slow it and sink it and spread it on our landscapes to store it in the water? Good ideas. Um, and then thinking about cycling waste, this is really, um, you know, lots and lots of people compost, which is fantastic. And there's worm composting, and there's these new soldier flies, which is a native insect, which is newly under, under domestication. Uh, for waste processing, which is a phenomenal compost organism and makes a great food for chickens and, and fish. Um, backyard poultry are a great way to take your food scraps and turn them into food and compost and meat eventually. Um, there are wonderful systems that are not legal in a lot of places yet for taking gray water, which would be your like your, your sink water and your shower water and your washing machine water and process it through constructed wetlands. They clean out all the extra nutrients, the phosphates and stuff that are in there. They turn that into plants, beautiful plants, um, and release clean water out of the other end that you can use for irrigation in your garden, or you can even return into natural bodies of water if you're doing it properly, and if that's legal to do where you are. Um, and then finally, there's composting toilets, which are sort of the very highest level I think you can get to. And that may be for the few and the proud at this point, but. And many places, it's not yet legal to do. Um, but when you're composting humanure, as they call it, and doing it properly and giving it lots of time to cook, you don't want to rush that. Um, it makes a very fantastic material. I wouldn't put it on a vegetable garden, but under fruit trees or in a native plant area where you're not eating things. Um, it's a marvelous material. And it's taking our waste out of the waste stream and putting it right back into the garden. And when you think about phosphorus cycling, there's no phosphorus in the atmosphere that night, there's no phosphorus fixing plants pulling that down. What you take out from a garden, you have to put back. And you can buy fertilizer or you can just cycle it. And these are all ways to think about ecologizing the garden, which are about more than, um, growing your own food or more than growing native plants. It's about really building an ecosystem that includes you, which I think is really fun. So we're also looking at mimicking some aspects of natural ecosystems. This is in my garden in 2009. I need to get a new, I'm trying to find the perfect picture this year, but there's a lot more vegetation in the way now. I haven't quite got it yet. So first we look at mimicking the structure of natural ecosystems. In this case, we have trees. That's an American persimmon. We have shrubs like josta berries. We have some vines in the back. There's a climbing spinach, Hiblitzia, tamnoides. Then we have some ground cover plants. There's some spring ephemerals, and there's things that come up later. So there's a seasonal sequence. There's mertensia in there, which, by the way, has edible leaves, bluebells. They call it oyster leaf. I don't care for them, but flavor is a very subjective thing. Um, edible fungi in there. So we have shade-loving plants growing under plants that provide shade. We're, we're looking at that multi-layered strata, just like a natural landscape has. We're also looking at building those relationships, looking at the social structure of an ecosystem. What are the niches? What are the mutually beneficial relationships? And that's where nitrogen fixation comes in. That's where the beneficial insects come in. So there's nitrogen-fixing species in here. There's species that attract beneficial insects. There's species that are preferred egg-laying sites for beneficial insects. So there is some research on where do lacewings prefer to lay their eggs, for example. Where do big-eyed bugs prefer to lay their eggs? And I've got some of those plants in there. Um, and I'm very excited about Phacelia, which I first saw at Mount Cuba. Facelia tanacea folia. I got some seed from Mount Cuba a few years ago, and it's finally flowering this year. It's absolutely gorgeous. And the, another species in that genus, a Western native one, is being grown commercially on farms for pest control all over Europe, but almost no one here. 
It's the story you see over and over again. Our native plants are taken and used in other places and we ignore them. Um, but uh, so I'm experimenting to see if I can observe any egg laying and so on on this one. It's very, the borage family is, tends to be excellent for beneficial insects um, in terms of egg laying. And fuzzy plants seem to be like yarrow and comfrey and some other things are always high on the list. So, um, and Facilia is also fuzzy. So I'm thinking between the nectar and the fuzz, I may have a decent shot there. And I'd love to see some research on that. Then the last thing, so that's we imitate the architecture. We imitate the social structure. But we also look at the successional dynamics of natural ecosystems. That is how they grow and change over time. And which is really about learning to think about your garden. And many of you do this probably better than me. Learning to think about your garden, not as a gardener, but as an ecosystem manager and as someone who is guiding succession towards a desired climax of some kind. So a lot of stuff about that is in the Edible Forest Gardens book, which you can, they have some of them out there if you want to take a look at them in the, the bookstore area there. And there are these things that happen in healthy ecosystems, many of which are still unknown to science, I can only imagine. And there are things that happen when you have a low spray, organic-based system, when you have a no-till, largely no-till, perennial, diverse mosaic of habitat types, different staggered layers, lumpy architectural texture, um, good organic matter in the soil, and uh, no chemical fertilizers, no herbicides, and, and, and no pesticides, or at least minimal, and all these things. There's these things that happen. And volume one of Edible Forest Gardens is all about that if you ever want to get a, you know, 300 page introduction to the agroecological um, issues there. The one I like is mycorrhizae. And you don't have to know any of that science to get these benefits. They just happen. Mycorrhizae is one. Mycorrhizal fungi are a special class of fungi, which um, are decomposers in the soil, but they also have a symbiotic relationship with plants, just like the nitrogen-fixing bacteria do, where they'll grow into the roots. Some kinds even grow into the cells of the plants. There's endo and ecto mycorrhizae. I can never remember who's who. But basically, they grow into the plants and they make an exchange. Mycorrhizal fungi are especially good at harvesting phosphorus from the soil. They can break phosphorus bonds, which are otherwise hard to do. They free up phosphorus in the organic matter in the soil. And they exchange it to the plants for carbohydrates. Again, um, they also have other benefits. For example, they share water back and forth. So each mycorrhizal fungus is connected to multiple plants and also to multiple other mycorrhizal fungi underground. And the theory is, excuse me, that um, at the time of colonization of this continent, from the edge of the tundra down to South Florida was basically there was a single contiguous network of these fungi. Not in every place, but you know they could go around. There were corridors, essentially, where they would go around, just like they say a squirrel could hop you know, from here to there. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, um, what we know is happening here in terms of human management. But um, this is really cool. And they don't just pass nutrients back and forth. They, they will move nitrogen from nitrogen fixers to non-nitrogen fixers. They'll pass hormones. That's part of how plants coordinate flowering times. And then a new study just came out that when plants are attacked by aphids, or any insect but aphids in this study, they um, release a, um, a signal that tells other plants, hey, there's aphids around. Prepare your defenses. Prepare your chemical defenses. And uh, this new study just showed that some of those uh, signals are passed through mycorrhizal fungi, which is pretty amazing. However, they're killed by tillage. Well, one subset of them is killed by tillage. Um, they're killed by synthetic fertilizers. They're obviously killed by fungicides. Um, so if you have a no-till organic system with perennial plants, you're getting this. You don't have to know it to benefit from it, but it's fun to know it. And you actually can inoculate them on purpose and speed up the process. 
And I think that's really cool. Um, there are very few edible ones. Mostly they don't even make mushrooms above ground, but one, that, well, two that are very popular would be morels and chanterelles, which are both excellent. And people are making good progress on cultivating morels on purpose, but no one knows how to grow a chanterelle yet, as far as I know. That's still, that would be a really cool thing to spend a million dollars on and try and figure that out for somebody. So a little bit about the history in this area. Um, uh, when colonists came, they saw these widely spaced trees and thought that God had created a paradise for them. Uh, there was lots of food, lots of plant foods, and lots of animal food. And it turns out they were misinterpreting. They, weren't, they didn't have the eyes to see, they didn't have the education to see native agroforestry management. In this case, this is a restored Baroque savanna, which is an anthropogenic ecosystem. In other words, an ecosystem created by people that in the absence of native burning disappeared and is now being restored. This one's at the University of Wisconsin Arboretum. So you get these wide spaced big trees, fire resistant trees, and succession is, there's disturbance underneath a frequent, a high frequency, low intensity burning that never causes a catastrophic fire because you're burning that fuel off every couple of years. Um, so this um, resulted in increases in human food production, both from the plant and, and animal level. Like I was saying, this is a great article on this by Carl Davies. Um, I have a link to that on the website, and I'll show you later. And these are some of the plants from this area that enjoyed these fires, fire-enjoying fire plants. Um, now, a chestnut or a hickory seedling is killed by fire, but once they're established, they have tough bark, and they can handle it. And those are all historically very important foods. Chestnuts, in fact, were burned in the fall after the nuts had fallen to the ground to remove the leaf litter so that you could find the nuts. Um, and then in the understory, lots of berries love fire. Raspberries love it. Lowbush blueberries require it. Um, and then you basically you got pasture for the deer and turkeys and so on. Um, these are some species that are known to have been cultivated by native people in the east. And I'm working on sort of uncovering the history of this and reading a lot of things written in the 1700s and stuff to try and find out. Um, this is very interesting. These are native species that are known to have been cultivated by native people. And if we're looking to find out what native plants are worth growing for food, this is a pretty good place to start. If you have thousands of years in a place, you figure out what's good to eat. I'll just point out a few things. The Yaupon holly is our native mate. It's our native caffeine plant. Very interesting. And that, while it's a coastal plant, it was grown way far inland by native folks, wherever they could get it to grow, because people like caffeine in every period of history. We have a native passion fruit, the maypop. Um, all kinds of really interesting stuff. The native lotus was grown very, very extensively, for example. Um, the, um, William Bartram writes about his experiences traveling through uh, grove, um, like plantations, he calls them, of hickory and native mulberry. These are, this is very interesting stuff. So I have an article about this on the website. I'll show you that as well. And there's even a group of plants which were domesticated some as early as 3,000 years ago by native people in the Midwest. And some of them were grown out farther into this area, in the eastern forest region anyway. They include a bunch of beans. Um, that's woolly bean on the top left there, which is very good. Very good eating. It's like a mung bean. Uh, sunflower, groundnut, amaranth. The, the bottle gourds, which actually are not native, they were brought here at least 10,000 years ago, already domesticated over the Bering Strait. And there's genetic studies. They figured out they were already domesticated, originally from Africa. Domesticated there, came through Asia, came across the land bridge, grown here, and actually used to make homes for purple martins, which were originally from the desert, and were brought out east to help control pests and mosquitoes. It's fascinating history. That's maygrass. Um, and I've grown most of these. I did a big grow out. I made a video about it. I wrote an article about it. Most of them are totally not worth growing. And what happened in the history is that they were under domestication, but corn, beans, and squash were already done and came up from Mexico 
and mostly people said, well, I, I, mean, I have to choose between something that makes an ear this big and something that makes one this big. What would you do? If you're a subsistence farmer, you're going to eat. Um, but that does not mean these don't have excellent potential. And many of these, sunflower obviously stayed in full cultivation, and some of these, like um, the groundnuts and Jerusalem artichokes and so on, continued to be at least semi-cultivated or wild-managed for right up until, and indeed, some of these are still cultivated and wild-managed by Native people today, in the East and elsewhere. Um, so that's a really cool uh, piece of history that I think a lot of us don't know. And if you want to read a great example of it in California, this very detailed, very detailed story of California indigenous management, the book's called Tending the Wild. And it's a history of 12,000 years of native management of landscapes with no agriculture, but intensive management of almost the entire state of California, except a few mountaintop ridges. Um, to maintain, to create and maintain anthropogenic ecosystems that can't survive without people that have disappeared in the absence of native burning, to begin this sort of incipient domestication of some of the species out there, actually irrigating wild plants, weeding and pruning wild plants. It's sort of a whole different take on what agriculture even is and could be. So um, to return to the present from some of the past, and it's not that there aren't people out there still doing this on small scales. And so I work with a group in California, for example, a native group in California doing this stuff. Um, this is my house when we got it. This was in 2004. Um, it was a very safe place to experiment <laughs> because you couldn't possibly make it any worse. And that was really what we felt about it. And, um, then this is 2011 on the same spot. We now have about 200 species of useful perennial and self-sowing plants. Um, we have a tremendous diversity of edible native plants. And I like to joke with people that, with um, native plant folks in particular, that you have the right to criticize the things I grow when you grow and eat as many native plants as I do. It's a joke. You can criticize me all you want. But, um, but we do grow beach plums and pawpaws and native grapes and native persimmons and so many kinds of native berries and so many kinds of native vegetables and some native grains and some native beans and some native aquatic crops and so on um, as part of the mix. And we now have a much better greenhouse than that. I need to get a new photo of that, too. But, and we did write a book about this. They have them out there, Paradise Lot. It's sort of the story of the development of this garden over about nine years at that point and the love story that came, came along with it. This is what um, July looks like at our place. Looking forward to that, as you can imagine. Um, it's very possible to grow lots and lots of berries without spraying. And most of these we don't even have to net. That's partly because we're in the city and our birds don't know what to do with berries. Like starlings don't really know what to do with berries. House sparrows don't seem to know what to do with berries for us. Pigeons don't really go for them. There's one cat bird that eats you know, everything it can, but mostly, and it keeps other birds away too. You know, They're sort of aggressive. Um, but this is very nice to be able to go out and pick this in your backyard and eat those things. This is a really fantastic experience. And, um, and this is where I've been encouraging people to start with edible landscaping is to plant some berries. They don't take up a lot of space. They're easy to grow. They're so good. Everybody loves them. Children love them. They're not hard to figure out how to cook or anything. You know, it's not like, what do I do with, I don't know, some weird vegetable or something. You just put them in your mouth and eat them. So that's pretty great. Um, so I want to just highlight a couple of species for this area from the native palette. Um, and those are beach plums, by the way. There are improved varieties of beach plum, which are stunning. Some of them are very, very good. Some of them are very, very good. For cooking, they're outstanding. For fresh eating, they're nice. But a good variety of beach plum, when you make like a cobbler out of it or something, is absolutely out of this world. Really, really wonderful. And there's a lot of work being done on domesticating them right now. So I'm looking for things that you can eat that don't have a lot of pest problems, and beach plums have a few um, that are pretty, that you can actually get your hands on from a nursery, um, that get sociable, meaning not 
sprawling and killing everything because plenty of native plants are every bit as annoying in the garden as the worst invasive plant from somewhere else. Um, and I'm trying to emphasize native. So those are my, my criteria here. And, and on the website um, is a list of about 200 useful native species of the mid-Atlantic area. Um, it says how much nitrogen they fix that they do. There's a talamy column in there, nectary as if they attract beneficial insects and so on. Um, and it's quite a lot of fun to work on this and sort of really assemble that palette. This is mostly drawn from the species tables in the back of Edible Forest Gardens, Volume 2, which have, there's over 600 useful species in there, about half of those are native. But I just pulled out the ones from this region in particular, and um, it's quite a lot of fun. So I just wanted to show a few of those. Uh, some of our native nut trees and the pecan, is a mid-Atlantic native, the black walnut, the shagbark hickory, shellbark hickory. And there are nurseries that sell grafted, excellent quality varieties of black walnut. If you've ever tried to take a wild black walnut around here and get the nut out, it's mostly shell, and the shell's all wrapped around the flesh like that, which is why native people mostly made milk and extracted oil from hickories and walnuts instead of eating the nuts. However, grafting allows for the propagation of exceptional wild species, and now there's been people crossing these things for a long time to develop superior strains. So you can get very nice grafted black walnuts that actually come out, not like an English walnut that you buy at the store, but pretty darn well. There are very nice grafted hickories that crack out really well. My favorite nut nursery is Nolan River in Kentucky, and they have a huge selection. They have, you know, 15 kinds of shagbark hickory varieties, grafted shagbark hickory varieties. That's pretty cool. And they'll even tell you what state the original one is from and so on. So um, I think that's pretty great. Native tree fruits, you know, we have the pawpaw, and there's excellent grafted pawpaw varieties out there that are really world-class fruits. There's excellent American persimmon varieties out there that are really delicious. I mean, really, when they're ripe. They're absolutely horrible when they're unripe, but when they're properly ripe, so they look like an overripe tomato, wrinkly and jelly-like inside, they're excellent. And at that point, they dry really well. And then we have the mayhaw, which is a native hawthorn. I believe it's native to Maryland, which is close enough, as far as I'm concerned, for you folks. Um, and it's used to make jam, jelly, I'm sorry, and apparently they say it makes the best jelly in the world. Mayhaw jelly is a big deal farther south, but it's actually native up here. Again, there's improved name varieties available for food. And of course, they're stunning in flower, and actually they're quite lovely in fruit as well, I think. They're much larger than regular hawthorns, more like a crab apple size. Uh, you have a native bamboo, which is every bit as annoying as Asian bamboo, but was very important ethnobotanically, is still in active use in the Midwest by native people, um, and is, has edible shoots and is useful for all the other things bamboo is useful for, for making a million products, uh, for livestock fodder, for visual screening, for erosion control, and for making your neighbors hate you forever. Um, so you would want to be very thoughtful about citing that. But this used to grow in riparian areas very extensively around the eastern forest region. Um, uh, but all, those are all the best places for farmland. So it all got tilled up. And you, I've never seen this in the wild. And I get around a little bit. I've never seen this in the wild. Um, and I think we should think about that. It's pretty interesting. It was used, there, there used to be uh, factories to make paper out of it back in the day. Uh, there's multiple different varieties. Some are very dwarf. There's even a deciduous dwarf one for full shade. There's an intermediate dwarf. Um, it's very cool. So we have native vining fruits. Muscadines are mid-Atlantic natives. And muscadines are excellent grapes. And if you've ever had, how many have had a muscadine? They're very nice. They have seeds. They have a thick skin. But their flavor is, I, yeah. But a nice variety, a good cultivated variety, is nice and sour grape. They make excellent jelly. They're sort of like a Concord type grape in a way. And they're so disease resistant. They can take the heat and humidity. They grow in the Everglades. They love heat and humidity. So compared to the regular grapes that all of us are struggling to get 
to do anything. I think that's a great choice. And we have a native passion fruit, the May Pop, which is really beautiful and it's a nice fruit. Um, you know, I talked about blueberries before, but I think service berries are, are a stunning fruit. A really, really nice. They're like a blueberry with um, almond flavored seeds. And there's clones, there's species that grow 50 feet high, which are hard to harvest. Um, and then there's, uh, there's some intermediate sized dwarves, like the, there was the one outside, which is a nice size. Um, there's Regent, which only grows about this high. And I have a Stoloniferae clone at home, and you can buy these, that only grows this high but runs in every direction. So it makes a beautiful ground cover of service berry flowers followed by delicious fruit. And it's native. I think that's something everybody should be growing. Um, oh, let's see. A couple of native perennial vegetables. We have ramps and, and ostrich ferns, which should be in every garden with some shade and, and moisture. Uh, native aquatic crops. This is a native lotus, the limbo lutea, which is as beautiful as anything in the world and has very nice edible roots. You know, lotus root, that's the root of a lotus. This was cultivated by native people, also for the nuts, which are very good. The leaves are used as tamale wrapping and has tons of uses. And then arrowhead, which is very beautiful, and they're sort of turnip flavored tubers which is not my favorite flavor, but people actually grow and eat turnips. So if you do, you should try those. Um, and the way I'll do those is, uh, actually both of these is I'll grow them in pots in my water garden. And at the end of the season, when they go dormant, you take out the pot, you turn it upside down and lift it off and all the tubers are on the bottom, like a pineapple upside down cake. So they're easy to harvest. I like that. Uh, and then native fungi, and this is one of my very favorites is the Strafaria mushroom or the garden giant or wine cap strafaria. One of the best flavored mushrooms anywhere. Very productive. Loves wood chips. I use wood chips for mulch. It likes fresh wood chips. And unlike most mushrooms, it's very easy to propagate. You can actually harvest some and take the, the sort of stump with mycelium and bury it under fresh wood chips where they're going to be irrigated and maybe a little shady and they'll continue to grow. As long as they're constantly moved to fresh wood chips every year, you can keep them going, which is really cool. And they're outstanding. Um, and they look beautiful, right? So, okay, then there's some fun things that aren't from here that are great, like chestnuts we love. And, well, you can grow Asian persimmons down here. I can't grow those. And those are fantastic fruit. Asian pears, asparagus. And this is a dwarf mulberry. This is a Giraldi dwarf, which makes huge amounts of fruit, just huge clusters of fruit on a tree about 10 feet high, which I think is excellent. Um, the leaves aren't any good to eat. Some mulberries have really nice edible leaves if you cook them. This one has horrible, but that's how you learn. So my, here's my challenge to the native plant movement, is to grow and eat edible native plants, to find the best ones, to go out. This is the Turkey Lake persimmon that my friend Craig went out. He lives in Florida. He went out eating wild persimmons. He found the best one. He grafted it. He brought it home in his nursery, and he started getting it out there. And I think it's, it's literally the low-hanging fruit for us. At this point, there's been so little work with a lot of these native edible plants that you can make a big difference just by finding the best native plum in your area. And I don't know how many native plums you have here, three, four, maybe five species of native plums in the mid-Atlantic. There's tons of them. Um, to begin to domesticate them and to learn to develop ecosystems that produce food largely with native plants and to consider eating to grow some pears and stuff too. And I think when any of us really look at our diet, it's not terribly realistic for any of us to eat exclusively native plants. It may take another 100 years of domestication to get to that point. So some of the challenges are you have to learn how to eat these things, how to cook them, what part to eat, when is it ripe. Um, there's, in the landscape, sometimes there's more of a mess to clean up. Um, there can be more pest management issues in some cases. Um, and finding the plants can be very difficult. Um, so a couple of the publications on my website, there's one called Useful Native Plants of the Mid-Atlantic, which is a big, that's the big long list. Um, there's an article on plants that were cultivated by native folks with all my sources that I drew that from, including some articles you can link to online the article about native nitrogen fixers and their relative nitrogen fixing capacity. Some are good and some are bad, and you want to plant the ones that are good if you're planting them for that reason. 
and some upcoming events, including I'll be doing a course at Dale's Place this September, right after a talk at Mount Cuba. So those will be some upcoming events um, to, to get more into this. And I just wanted to plug a few resources. One of them I helped to write, but it is very good, that Edible Forest Gardens book. Um, is full of information on mimicking ecosystems and, and on useful native plants. Uh, the Apios Institute is a wiki that I help to run, like a Wikipedia, where people share information about these plants and how they're growing and the, the species combinations they're growing them in. This is that Tending the Wild I was talking about that goes in the history of indigenous management in California, which is an absolute must read for anybody who's interested in ethnobotany, ecological history. The other one that talks more about the East is called Forgotten Fires. And that's really about the, the sort of lost legacy of native burning in the East. And the vast areas that were open grasslands here that were maintained by fire by native folks, we think of it as having all been forested, but there were big, big gaps. So Forgotten Fires has a section on the East based on documentary history. It's very good. Mycelium running, this is a great one on mushroom growing. Forger's Harvest um, and the companion volume, Nature's Garden, I think are the very best books on edible wild plants for this area with incredible information. 20 pages on harvesting wild rice, 60 pages on oak processing, acorn processing, more than you would ever want to know. And he really focuses not on the common things that are in every wild plants book, but on the obscure native stuff that nobody's eating and using. And you could use them he doesn't talk about growing them, he talks about eating them, but you take one book that says how to grow it and another one that says how to eat it and you put them together. And my favorite nursery for the fruits and nuts, native fruits and nuts, is Oikos tree crops. No one else comes close to offering that many varieties. They've improved native hazel, chokeless choke cherry, on and on and on and on and on down those. It's not all native stuff, but they have a huge selection of useful native plants. And I would also say that there's this guy, Dale, I hate to keep plugging him, but he's my, um, he does have an excellent collection of the best improved varieties of groundnut for this area, the native Apios Americana, and he has hog peanuts and a bunch of other really excellent stuff, native elderberries, um, which are the, it's very hard to find a lot of this stuff. A lot of it I've had to go out and wild collect seed to get it in the trade at all. And I don't expect that most people are gonna go and do that. So I don't, most people shouldn't go and do that. We should get them in and then grow them out from there. So, um, so that's a little bit about where that is. And we have just a few minutes for uh, questions. Questions, comments, thoughts? Sure, yeah. Sure. Um, well, it depends uh, how you define it, I guess. There's lots of people who are doing, um, well, I mean, there's orchards and berry farms and stuff. Uh, I'm working with a bunch of folks in the permaculture movement on ramping this model up to commercial scale. I can't point you to anybody yet in this area who's doing, say, black walnuts with pawpaws underneath with black raspberries under them with ramps and ostrich fern and mushrooms under there. But I am doing my very best to hurry people along in that direction. And you should do it. Yeah. Other thoughts, questions? Yeah. You mentioned blueberries. Um, where I grew up, we distinguished between blueberries and rabbit eyes and huckleberries. Sure, uh, yes. What, what are the differences? Are they all blueberries? Sure. OK, well, there are two, there's two genera in play, there's vaccinium, which includes highbush blueberry, lowbush blueberry, rabbit eye blueberry, and a number of other interesting blueberry species. There's some nice, there's an evergreen one, ground cover one here. Um, and then Galicacea is the huckleberries, which sometimes people call other blueberries huckleberries, and they have an also very nice fruit, which tends to be darker, almost black, with a little bit crunchier seeds. They're also very good. They grow in the same habitat. They're often all intermingled with each other. Well, it grows with low bush blueberries particularly. Uh, so there's lots of them. And most of us have only ever had high bush blueberries or maybe some low bush blueberries, but there's all these other species. There's Vexini mashii, the rabbit eye blueberry. 
Um, there's a bunch of them, and I apparently lots of them are very good. Some of them have smaller fruits, some of them aren't as good, but um, I don't know to what extent those other things are in the trade, but a, a place like Mount Cuba might have a collection of 20 or 30 or 40 different species of them, for all I know. So it would be a great thing to investigate. Yeah. Anybody else? One or two more? Yeah. Well, uh, there are many that are listed as edible. And um, actually, the forager's harvest, he goes in great detail into that. There, there's one of the highbush cranberries that he likes. I have never had one that I liked. And also, there um, is a nanny berry that he, I never liked it raw. And he said, it's not a fruit that you eat like that. You have to think about it like a banana. And you have to make you have to sort of make creamy things out of it. So he talks about how to process some of these things in interesting ways. That didn't get me to plant an nanny berry. They're named that way because they smell like sheep, which is not a good sign in a food usually, um, except lamb, I guess. But um, yeah, he, he definitely recommends those. Uh, a bunch of them are hobble bush is edible, for example, tastes terrible. Mostly they're a big pit with a little bit of flesh that tastes bad. Um, but it's an area for experimentation and improvement and, and, and his, I would start with his book and read what he says about those two and those are probably two of the best candidates. Yeah. Well, we're at 10.15, so uh, if you'd like to stick around and chat, I think there's a little bit of a break period before the next person, but I'll set you free and thanks very much. Mm -hmm.